We're here today with Chris Van Hook, founder of Clean Green Certified. Chris, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your experience with cannabis? I will. Jay, and thank you very much. I'm glad to be here with Cannabis Reports, and uh, uh, it's an honor to be here, and thank you for the invitation. My name is Chris Van Hook, and I'm the director of a Clean Green Certification Program. It's the only nationally recognized cannabis certification program based on the uh, USDA National Organic Program. And uh, we're certifying cannabis in uh, six states now, uh, California, Oregon, Washington, Colorado, Nevada, and Florida. And I'm also a medical cannabis compliance attorney here in California. So I've been working, this is my 14th year. I think last year we certified close to 20,000 pounds. And we certify uh, flowers, uh, edibles, tinctures, body care products. So anything that is certifiable under the National Organic Program is certifiable under the Clean Green Program. Wonderful. And can you tell us a little bit more about what Clean Green Certified does and how it came about? Sure. Well, <clears throat> it's interesting. I, it came about at the request of the industry. I, was, uh, I began uh, certifying uh, all agricultural crops and food processing uh, facilities in 2003. And uh, in the last part of 2003, I was uh, contacted by a cannabis farmer who said, can we certify your, can you certify my cannabis as organic? So I wrote a an email to the head of the California Organic Program and he said yes, but the federal organic program said no. Cannabis is not a federally recognized agricultural crop, so it's therefore not eligible for organic certification. Well, the farmer said, well, isn't there something you can do? The industry really needs it. I said, sure, we'll start the Clean Green Certification Program. So I essentially, you know, uh, found and replaced organic in my applications with Clean Green. And that's an important uh, issue because there is no organic cannabis. And really, anybody that claims that their cannabis is organic is sort of screaming to the world that I know nothing about the organic program. And uh, it really is leading to a lot of consumer confusion and, uh, and uh, you know, difficulty in the industry. And I think that's only allowed in the unregulated world of cannabis. If, if these farmers were claiming to be organic in any other agricultural crop, they would be contacted within the first few months by their county ag commissioners or the state. So it's actually an $11,000 per violation federal labeling infraction to call your cannabis organic. And one might wonder, well, how come that's never being enforced? And it's really just an issue of government inertia. You know, the cannabis industry is moving so quickly that, and the government's inertia and slow moving just simply isn't able to keep pace. But I can absolutely guarantee that as it becomes legal, and once it's become federally legal, the cannabis farmers that are claiming organic status will be contacted probably within a couple of months. So. I think it's a matter of consumer beware that if somebody's claiming organic cannabis, uh, consumer beware. Wonderful. Can you tell us a little bit about the processes that actually go on when you're inspecting these farms and what you're looking for? Yeah, sure, absolutely. And again, we don't just do farms. We do uh, farms and processing and handling. So one thing that's important with the Clean Green program is we don't make up answers and we don't make up uh, what we're doing. We're basically taking the existing uh, agricultural food handling and processing regulations and moving them into the cannabis industry. And I think that's where we differ from some of the other uh, certification companies that are out there. Uh, there are only 84 entities around the world that have made it through the USDA organic accreditation process. And we are one of those 84. And so when we say something under the Clean Green Program or when we re require something under the Clean Green Program, it's not something that we've made up. It's something that is already in existing regulatory frameworks and we're just moving that into the cannabis industry. So what we look for is, again, just as if you were growing tomatoes or broccoli, we start at the very beginning. We start with uh, what type of soil you're using, what type of cutting solution are you using if you're using one. What are the inputs? What are the fertilizers that you're using in the veg stage, in the flower stage? What are the uh, pest control mechanisms that you're using? Are you using naturally based pest control or are you using synthetics? So anything that's allowed under the National Organic Program is allowed under the Clean Green Program. Anything that's prohibited under the National Organic Program is prohibited under the Clean Green Program. But it's not only the organic program. 
The California Department of Food and Ag and the federal EPA have come out with guidelines for pesticide use in marijuana production. And so those guidelines are interpreted the same way that we've been interpreting those regulations for years. And that's simply that there are no registered pesticides for cannabis. And it is against federal law to use a registered pesticide not in compliance with their label. So all of the Eagle 20, all of the Microbutanol, all of the Avid that's being used is just a blatant violation of federal law. So when, when a farmer gets Clean Green certified, not only are they a certified known farmer, but they're also complying with both state and federal guidelines on pesticide use in cannabis. So we look at the pesticides, and then we also, uh, again, it's not just uh, the crop production, we also follow it all the way through to on-farm processing. Does their drying and curing room, is it clean washable surfaces? Are the tables clean washable surfaces? Is there a, you know, bathroom facilities nearby? Is there a hand wash station? Uh, uh, are they using clean washable bulk storage containers? Are they using clean washable or new food grade uh, packaging for their products? And really, it doesn't have to be sophisticated. You know, literally, a, uh, uh, a jug of water with a bar of soap on a tree stump is a hand washing station. So that, you know, we don't necessarily tell them how to comply, but they just need to have a hand wash station nearby. So what we've done, this is our 14th year now certifying cannabis, and it's, uh, um, I, I'm proud to say that we've really helped clean up the, the cannabis industry because, you know, years ago, people would be working in the fields without those. So even if you're in a remote location, you can still address those issues and meet the existing standards and provide a much safer, better quality product. So that's the farm. We follow it from seed or cutting all the way to the final packaging ready to the dispensary or the outlet. And then just like the organic program, there's a processor handler certification as well. And that starts once they receive that bulk product. Now, again, under the organic program, if they're going to open that bulk package, repackage it, reprocess it, or make any sort of edible or processed product from it, they need to be certified. The goal and the intent is so that when the final consumer purchases a organic product or a clean green certified product, they can be assured that it's been third party certified by qualified individuals all the way from that final packaging through the processor handler, through the outlet, to the farm, and all the way back to cedar cutting. So the processor handler certification starts from receiving the bulk product. Are they having clean washable surfaces to break it apart? Are they have a hand wash station nearby? Do they have mechanisms in place across the six states we're currently working with lot numbers and trackability and traceability to make sure that that consumer, when they're buying a clean green certified product, it actually can be traced back to the grower that produced it. And so um, what we do for the processor handler, and again, is there packaging material, uh, food grade packaging, are there labels uh, appropriate? And is there a lot number on that final label that will correlate all the way back to the bulk product they received and which would correlate to the farmer that grew it? So it's really important to have both a processor handler and a, um, a producer certificate. But there's that middle section sometimes it's a processor handler that's making an edible product or a body care product or a tincture. And they also have to be certified as processor handlers. Now, what does that mean? An edible maker, that means that, again, under the organic program, under existing food regulations, do they, are they making it in a licensed kitchen? Do they have food serve safe certified staff on hand each production run? Can they trace back where all of their ingredients came from? Are all of their ingredients organic, if available? Are they using Clean Green Certified product for their cannabis? So if you get a Clean Green Certified edible company, for example, that's Clean Green Certified, that consumer can rest assured that it's made in a licensed kitchen, that they've got food serve safe people on staff, that they've got uh, all organic ingredients, uh, if, if available, you know, your sugar, your flowers, your chocolates, all those are available as organic and that cannabis is clean green certified. So again, 
we don't make up these regulations. These are the exact same regulations we'd be looking at if we were there to, to uh, audit or to certify an existing organic cookie manufacturer. Body care products, the same. You know, is your coconut oil organically certified? Is your shea butter organically certified? So really, the Clean Green Certified Program is the only program that fully trains cannabis, cannabis industry to move into the legal realm. And it's, again, it's not necessarily just for the organic realm. Whether you're producing an organic or non-organic cookie, you're still going to need a licensed kitchen. You're still going to need traceability. You're going to still need all of that. So what do we do when we go to a processor handler? We will look at, for example, a cookie in a retail packaging, which should have a label on it with a lot number that we can trace back to the date of production. And on that date of production, there would be a list of the flour and the chocolate or the shea butter and the coconut oil, which would all have lot numbers, which would trace back to the day of receipt. And when we go to that receipt, we can pull out the organic certificate for that ingredient. And that's what it means to be a clean green certified uh, uh, processor handler or producer. Wonderful. So that's the clean green certified accreditation is really coveted. Have you seen issues with people claiming to be clean green certified and they're absolutely not on the list? Absolutely. We get that, you know, I guess that's sort of a uh, a compliment in a way, um, but that is a problem that we've had, an ongoing problem. And um, I will say that uh, it's largely a problem here in California. Um, what we ask, instead of track tracing everybody down and threatening them with trademark infringement or threatening them with the logo licensing infringement, we go back and we ask the consumer, help us protect this certification. It's not my certification, it's our certification. We are all part of it. As a consumer, if someone's claiming to be Clean Green certified, ask to see their certificate. And on that certificate, there will be an expiration date. And so if they're claiming to be Clean Green certified, whether it's your pro producer or handler, or whether it's your crop producer, if they're claiming to be Clean Green certified, ask to see their certificate. On that certificate, there will be a certification number, not a name or an address, but a certification number. And you can go to our website at www.cleangreencert.com and you can verify that that certification number is in fact current and true. We've had people Photoshop certificates off the internet. We've had people Photoshop our logo and stick it on. And really, as much as we try to track down these people, it's really the consumers out there in the field that notify us when somebody's making those claims. So we appreciate that from our consumers, and uh, it is an ongoing problem, and we do all we can to try to, try to combat it. Well, like you said, it's a compliment for folks to be having the <laughs> knockoff accreditations circulating. But it's a compliment, but for the consumer, though, that's really what the whole basis is, is we want to make sure if that consumer is buying something they think is Clean Green certified, they should take the little effort and ask to see that certificate and take that number and go to our website to find out. That's the only way that we're going to be able to, to keep the integrity of the program. So in terms of integrity, you are the road warrior that has been traveling around six states for you know over a decade certifying <laughs> these farms. Can you tell us a couple of uh, horror stories, things that were just <laughs> abysmal, you know, oh my gosh, how is someone still yeah. doing this? Well, there's a couple, um, if we've got the time. Um, one little old lady, adorable little grandmother type, came up and said, oh, I'm completely organic, I'm completely organic. Uh, my only question is, can I use human manure as a fertilizer? Now, this person had been producing cannabis and distributing it through you know, very well-known, reputable dispensaries. Oh, no. And the answer, we can go back to the National Organic Program standards. I don't have to make up an answer, but no, human sewage is not allowed under the National Organic Program. And I don't care sort of what environmental ethic conversation we could have about the value of human manure. It's not allowed on a certified product. That's one. That's one reason why consumers should not trust somebody saying we're organic and trust a 
qualified third-party certification. Another one was uh, a guy said, oh, I'm completely organic, I'm completely organic, and two weeks before harvest, in order to get rid of the spider mites, he closes up his grow room, pops off a pyrethrin bomb, and douses his entire crop two weeks before harvest. Now, that is not certifiable, even though he's calling himself organic. And we pick that up when we do a soil sample. Every farmer every year gets a soil sample collected and sent to a federally licensed agricultural lab, the same lab that we use for our organic company. And they're screened for 75 compounds, which equates to about 150 brand names out on the market. And sure enough, we picked up synthetic pyrethrins. Now this is a person that says, I'm organic, you know, and I've been selling organic for years. Interesting, another story, last one, is uh, uh, I went to a farm and uh, it was interesting. He had everything laid out, you know, all the inputs that he was using. It was great. It was all organic, OMRI listed in ingredients. When I went out to the field to do the inspection, there was a tarp of a pile. And I asked the farm, you know, the worker out there, I said, what's under here? He said, oh, those are all the fertilizers we use. We pulled out the tarp and of course it was all thin synthetics. That's the importance of doing on-site inspections, but not just on-site inspections, having qualified personnel look, doing those uh, inspections. Every one of our inspectors under the Clean Green program either is currently or would qualify to be an inspector under the uh, USDA organic program. So those are some of the stories. Every, all three of those people were claiming to be organic, and um, again, that would only exist in the unregulated world of cannabis. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. So we're rapidly approaching the regulated world of cannabis. And although no one knows exactly what that's going to look like, you have implemented procedures and standards from existing regulatory structures. The question that I have is how does Clean Green Certified help these businesses, these processors, cultivators with the legal compliance side? Okay, good question. Now, uh, I am a medical cannabis compliance attorney here in California, so uh, we're able to answer all sorts of legal questions on medical cannabis compliance. But no matter what state we work in, you have to be eligible for certification before you even get into the process. So there's a, uh, a pre-screening that occurs. And um, number one, in you know, Oregon, Washington, Colorado, Nevada, Florida, everybody is registered in those states. So you need to be a permitted registered grower even to begin to apply. In California, we, uh, we do not have that registration yet in the state, it's coming. But uh, you have to have an arguably defendable reason, uh, you know, uh, uh, where is all this cannabis going? And what sort of business structure are you in? So we get a lot of people that call us, you know, and we don't care what you charge, we want to get certified. And what are you doing with all this cannabis? Well, we're shipping it back east. Well, those people aren't even eligibly certified. And that's another important thing that the consumer can play a part of. You know, the consumer has a huge, valuable part to play in this, just as we do in, 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 in blood diamonds. You know, uh, if, you're, if you're buying an unlicensed, unknown cannabis, you don't know if it's been grown on national forests, you don't know if it's been grown in a house with poor electricity and young children sleeping in the other room. Uh, you don't know, uh, you know, what type of labor relations they were using for the trimmers. You don't know if they're using human trafficked uh, trimming crews from Guatemala. You don't know any of that if it's an uncertified product. But when you reach for a clean green certified product, you know that not only is it being grown legally in that state, but there's also fair labor and fair trade practices in place. You have to have, uh, you know, uh, appropriate housing and appropriate uh, sanitary conditions and appropriate food for your trimmers if you're coming in. And then there's also a carbon footprint reduction program. You cannot get certified as a clean green producer or processor handler unless you have a carbon footprint reduction program in place, and that program has to improve every year. So it really is much more than just how you're growing. It really is a more inclusive program of, you know, honestly, of sustainability, of fair labor, and more important during this years of the drought 
is you have to have water conservation practices in place and you need to have a legal water source. So you know when you're reaching for a clean green certified product that farmer's not pumping out of the creeks, that farmer's not damming up some of the salmon streams. You know, we've all seen horrible stories about that. So uh, it, it, um, that's all real important and the consumer has an awful lot of weight and they need to use it. The same consumer that buys organic uh, you know, cotton yoga pants or shade-grown, bird-friendly, fair-trade organic coffee needs to make that same reach when they're looking for their cannabis. So. Wonderful. So as you know, Cannabis Reports is incredibly concerned with consumer safety and transparency. How would a company that would like to be Clean Green certified, get in touch with your uh, association and schedule an inspection? Well, first of all, they could certainly, uh, you know, contact Cannabis Reports because Cannabis Reports can uh, uh, lead them, direct them to the Clean Green Certified program. So if they're already familiar with your website, they can certainly go there. And, uh, or they could go directly to our website at www.cleangreencert.com. That's cleangreencert.com. And, uh, uh, click right on there, contact us through that website, whether they're a producer, uh, maker of edibles, tinctures or body care products, or just a handler. Chris, can you tell me a little bit about the quality of the people that are Clean Green certified? Uh, I can. You know, I'd be happy to because, again, the program's not me. It's not, it, it's really about the farmers. And, uh, you know, when we started this 14 years ago, uh, uh, we heard repeatedly that you can't grow good cannabis organically. You can't grow good cannabis organically. But I'm really proud to say that a clean green certified grower has won the San Francisco High Times Medical Cannabis Cup since it started in 2010. A clean green certified grower has won 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, and again in 2015 has won third place in the, San uh, in the Seattle High Times Medical Cannabis Cup, has won Judge's Choice of Dope Magazine 2014, has won the San Francisco Patient's Choice Cup in 2012, 14, and 15, uh, has placed in the top 5% of the Emerald Cup every year that we've been involved, has won first place the last three years, won Southern Oregon's Cannabis Cup in four or five different uh, um, uh, categories and won uh, Oregon Leaf Hybrid of the Year. So really, not only did we convince the world that you can grow the finest cannabis in the world organically, when you come, when you join the program, you're really grouping yourself in with some world-class growers. And what's important to know is that we maybe only have 100, 120 growers in our group right now. But these are the types of awards, and these are the type of awards that they're growing. So really, you know, as my friend Jorge said, if you want to hang out with winners, get Clean Green certified. <laughs> Wonderful. You know, we've seen our, our uh, share of excitement around your program. One of our friends down in Southern California, Green Soldiers Healers, is offering only Clean Green certified flowers, and we've seen firsthand a lot of excitement from their patients. Um, can you speak on the network that is surrounding this? I know that there are several growers associations that are very devoted to Clean Green Certified. There are, uh, thank you. There are, um, it really, it's the, you know, when we started 14 years ago, it really was those that were way out ahead of the curve that were calling to get certified. And I got a really handed to uh, Green Soldiers Healing because when they started up, they saw the value of the program and they just, you know, made the determination that they were just going to handle Clean Green Certified product. And I can't tell you how many requests we get uh, in the Los Angeles area. You know, I have cancer, I've, I'm sick, where can I get some Clean Green Certified product? So we're very glad that we can um, direct people finally to, to uh, Denise and Green Soldiers Healing. Uh, we need more down there. There's a huge demand for it. In Seattle, we've now, we've had over 100 requests. Where can we find it? And that's what I'm hoping that we can uh, develop and continue to work with Cannabis Reports to help link our growers and to help link our locations, maybe through your website, and uh, somehow have a mechanism 
that's available for people to locate where the Clean Green Certified Cannabis is, is located. Because uh, we have a lot of requests and we do not yet have enough outlets for the growers that we have. Excellent answer. Um, this is a, an oddball question. Uh, I would love to ask it though. I want to give you the opportunity to do a, and I told you so a moment, five years ahead of time. What do you think the regulatory structure is going to evolve into? Just from your expertise and your standpoint right now, give us an idea of what could happen in the next five years as bigger players come in, more experienced in terms of consumable regulatory structures, those individuals are getting ready to get on the train, so. Yeah, well, that's a good, good question. I think, I think part of the problem with the cannabis industry is sort of this isolated naivety of so many people in the industry. They say, well, we're going to develop regulations or we're going to develop, you know, best practices and try to sell it to the state. And when I go to the state meetings, they sort of chuckle at that. And um, they say, no, we're fully competent in regulating this industry as soon as we are tasked with it. So what I think is going to happen is that the existing regulations and standards are going to simply be transferred to the cannabis industry. You're still going to need a hand wash station. You're still not going to be able to use prohibited substances on your crops. If you're making edibles, you're still going to need a refrigerator thermometer that monitors the temperature of your freezers and your th refrigerators. All of those existing um, regulations are just going to simply be transferred into the cannabis industry. It's really not going to be a matter of the cannabis industry telling the state how to do it. The state's already very, very comfortable regulating this as an agricultural crop and as an edible product. But what I do often tell people is that the train's leaving. The train has already left the station. The regulations are coming in and, um, and they're only going to become greater and greater. At this point in time, if you're just waking up to that, you know, you almost have to run down the platform and jump to see if you can make it onto the caboose. Because as it becomes legal, right down at the very first stop, right at the next stop that train's going to stop at, there's a lot of people that are going to come on. These are the, you know, the, the greenhouse, the Nur California Nurserymen's Association, the, you know, the flower growers, all these people are anxious to get into the cannabis industry, are waiting for it to become legal, and it's not big corporate, and it's not big corporations, and it's not bad people. These are family farms that have been producing roses and orchids and, you know, our landscape plants that want to move into this industry. And they already know about permits. They already know about pesticide regulations, and they're already familiar with it. So I really think that the cannabis farmers that want to stay in the industry in the future have really got to start adapting and, and getting on that wagon because in the next five years, this is going to be, if it's not federally legal, it's certainly going to be state legal in more states and they're going to require all these regulations. So if any farmer is looking to get you know, to stay in the industry, I'd say get started now because there's a lot of people that are very qualified that are ready to move in as soon as, uh, soon as uh, they're able to. So going to back to on something you said, um, well, I guess let me extrapolate. <laughs> the, the regulations that have been presented as of now, you know, there's still a lot that's being determined when recreational comes in. There's going to be a whole nother slew. Potentially, they'll draw from the same, the same stuff. When it comes to monitoring consistency and safety in an agricultural product. Where is cannabis, what makes cannabis more complex than other products like corn or like tomatoes? And how, how can, what are the dangers in, re, in that regulation? I mean, for the state to come in and say, oh, we're going to apply the same style of, of rules and the same you know, style of forms just changed over to cannabis, what could they miss? Well, uh, interesting. Now, when I say that the state's going to move in with their regulations, I mean uh, you're not going to be able to use prohibited substances. You're not going to be able to clear off hillsides and, and uh, have soil erosion. You're not going to be able to you know, use uh, you know, human trafficked labor. Those are the regulations I'm talking about. 
uh, you're going to need a, uh, you know, hand wash stations, uh, refrigerators, etc. But the difficulty in cannabis is that even though we've got you know excellent seed companies producing world class seeds, we're still only a few generations away from wild. It's not at all like corn where you can pick a P34 corn and close your eyes and go out and harvest it in 80 days. You know, we're, we're just not at that point in the hybridization and the standardization of cannabis seeds. Also, there's wide variation in terpenes and THC and CBD of the same seed grown in a different location or even on the north side and the south side of the same plant. So um, I think that's going to be a unique difficulty with the cannabis. But I think it's also, uh, as you're smoking the flowers, I think that that's sort of a testament to the inherent safety of cannabis, is that, um, you know, you can, uh, they will sort of mix in and get a general THC level of that particular uh, plant. Now, that brings me to the whole issue of, of licensed and unlicensed labs. Because right now in the cannabis industry, certainly in California, all we have testing cannabis are unlicensed labs. So what we really need to answer your question is we need the federal government to allow federally licensed agricultural labs to test, for cannab test cannabis in the states that allow cannabis to be grown. And until we get, until we allow for those licensed accredited laboratories to get involved, we're really just you know, throwing dice as far as with these unlicensed labs. I mean, there's very educated people running them. They're you know, very smart people. They've done a lot of work in the terpenes, but we still need that standardization. Now, the flowers are relatively safe because of their low THC compared to the concentrates. But once you get into the edibles and the concentrates, I think we're going to have a lot of regulatory issues that are going to come up. And I think that's where we're going to, I think that's actually where, um, you know, cannabis reports work in that field is going to be very important. Because we're going to see, if you're blending an edible or a uh, vaporizable uh, concentrate, you're really going to need a, uh, a, you know, a database, sort of what you guys have developed, so that a scientist or a food scientist can blend terpenes and come to a uniform concentrate or a uniform edible uh, that's the same each time. I think that's going to be difficult. Uh, you know, what we used to do is grow a bunch of weed and, and put it in uh, butter and mix it into your brownies and who knew what was going to happen. I don't think that technology is going to move into the regulated world. I think you're really going to get to what you guys have been doing, where you're developing terpene profiles and, and specific batch uh, uh, standards, so that much like olive oil, much like uh, wine, uh, the food scientist will be able to blend the olives, blend the wine, blend the cannabises to come to a standardized product. So I think that's going to be a difficulty that's unique to cannabis as we started this question. But um, I think the flowers are going to have a general THC reading. But I think it's really going to become important when you have the uh, edibles and the concentrates. Great. Tell me about your, when your relationship with cannabis started. Oh, well, you know, I mean, just like almost everybody, uh, you know, I started growing weed when I was a kid. And uh, actually, when I started, if we had found a bud, we would have pulled it off and wondered what the heck that was. You know, if we had a shopping bag full of leaf, we were thrilled. So uh, I guess from there, it's grown uh, uh, to the modern cannabis industry. So uh, we've seen it quite a bit. I think that uh, I think that we've. Uh, I was an abalone farmer for many years. I was a marine biologist. I'm not sure that I would have ever thought I could grow abalone if I wasn't getting high. And I know darn well I couldn't have worked those 16 hours on the water if I wasn't. So, you know, I think that it's a real fallacy for for the the country to say that cannabis is bad, cannabis is wrong. And you know, I'm going to um, point to this story. Remember when the Hurricane Sandy wiped out the uh, New Jersey shore? Devastating. Well, it was the pot smoking music industry that 20 days later raised, what, $20 million for that industry, whereas the straight, hard drinking regulators haven't done anything yet. 
So, you know, the whole concept of marijuana being for losers or marijuana being for, uh, you know, sort of dropouts is, is such old information that's, just, you know, it really is not helpful. You know, I'm a, I'm a um, lifelong conservative Republican. I a, haven't voted for one in years. I think the party's gone nuts, but by golly, I still is one. And, um, you know, uh, a fiscally, fiscally conservative, socially moderate, been a member of the California Farm Bureau for over 35 years. So nobody's going to outflank us from the right. And I'm, I'm, I'm really proud to say that I'm working in the cannabis industry. And I think all of us need to be really proud that we're in the cannabis industry because, you know, we need to be able to put the face of cannabis out as it is today. And, you know, it's not like reefer madness or it's not like, you know, a bunch of Mexican smoking joints in L.A. in the 50s. You know, we are the cannabis industry. And if we can't be proud of the industry we're in, then we shouldn't be in it. And that's why it gives me great pride to say that I'm working in the medical cannabis and the adult use cannabis industry. And um, like I say, we are the cannabis industry, so we should be real proud of it. And everybody that's in the modern industry should be proud of what we're doing. Great. Uh, tell me about your future hopes for Clean Green Certified and the industry as a whole. Well, um, you know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the Clean Green Certified program moving into different states. Uh, it's exciting each time we get a phone call from a new state. Um, I think that's great. I, I think that as it becomes federally legal, it will roll largely out of the Clean Green program into the USDA organic program. And I think that'll be a welcome, that'll be a really great thing for consumers, and I think it'll be a welcome development. But I still think that there will be a place for the Clean Green program because I'm not sure that indoor cannabis will ever be certifiable as organic. Because, uh, you know, under the organic regulations, it requires sunlight and air and fresh air and, and water and access to outdoors and that kind of stuff. So I think there will always be a place uh, for the Clean Green program. But I'm just excited to be in it at this time of such change. And as it develops and moves, we'll be adapting and changing with it. Hey. That's, I just wanted to get that on Oh, good. Camera. Jay, I sure do appreciate it. Again, I want to thank Cannabis Reports very much for allowing me to come in and, and have this conversation. We are thrilled to have you. And again, for everyone watching, this is Chris Van Hook, the founder of Clean Green Certified. Started in 2003 and have been accrediting farms for our sake as consumers ever <laughs> since. Thanks again, Chris. Thank you very much. Glad to be here.